Hello and welcome. Singing and dancing became a natural way for her to express herself from an early age. And by the time she was a teenager, she'd become a multi-award winning pop performer. But her real challenge began when she left home to launch an international career from Europe. This week on One on One, meet Indonesia's top singing star, Anggun. Music was an important part of her life from an early age, as she was encouraged by her parents to sing and perform. By the age of seven, Anggun went public with her talent and started on a rapid path to youthful stardom in the Indonesian city of Jakarta, where she was raised. Her teen years were guided by a skilled producer who helped her create a string of top rock and roll albums that made her something of a national treasure. But Anggun's greatest hits were to come once she moved to Europe as a 20-year-old. After an initial struggle to establish herself, she evolved her musical style, hitting the charts with the atmospheric Snow on the Sahara in 1997. Further international albums continued to elevate her presence as a versatile talent and Indonesia's most established musical export. Angun, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Now, your name, Angun, means a grace born in a dream. Uh, that is the whole name, Angun Cipta Sasmi. Yeah. And that, and and I know very much from listening to Snow on the Sahara. Um, <laughs> that, you know, it's got you've got that feel about you. But what are you focusing your energies on right now? What is it that you mostly focus on? I'm actually right now. I'm I'm in the middle of writing new materials for my new album. So uh, it's and and I have a lot of you know traveling goes back and forth uh, for that, and also for my UN commitments as goodwill ambassadors and. And, and now I'm a mother, so it's all, it's, it's very hectic and crowded life, but I love it. You were born in, in Jakarta, and raised in Yogyakarta, I think it's pronounced? Yogyakarta, no, it's actually a city of my mother, ah. uh, but um, uh, I was born and raised in Jakarta. And what do you remember of those early years, the environment there, the kind of the setting that you had as a childhood? Very artistic. My father was a book writer and he was, um, he was an artist. He, uh, our house were always full of uncles who were actually poets and painters and um, they're always like, they're always people in the house and, and we don't usually go to sleep before midnight or one. We didn't have the same uh, or we didn't have a normal sort of say uh, uh, um, childhood as, as any other people in my age. Um, but it was certainly more richer, I think. He sent you to a Catholic school because he wanted you to be, well, A, more aware of other religions as well, but also, as he called it, you know, like a stronger education. Did it, did it take its toll on you? <laughs> yeah, well, actually, because my father was always, you know, the rebel one in the family. You know, he said, it, it, religion is something very personal. It's between you and God. You have to choose it yourself. So, yeah, after that, you know, it's, it's always, well, my father is, 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 is always one of my real model in life. And your mother was a very, I guess, like strong, typical Javanese woman. She, she used to croon you to sleep singing yes. traditional folk songs. How much did that rub off on you? <laughs> well, my mom, my mother, she's the sweet one, the, the most patient person. And yeah, typical Javanese, as you said. And um, we Indonesian believe that, um, well, Javanese women are the, um, the, the women of women. <laughs> it's, just, it's very, I don't know, I have this uh, uh, maybe a character from my father. Uh, the kind of a strong will and, and, and I have the patience of my mom. You actually started uh, getting interest in music at a very early age. At seven, you did your first live yes, performance. Yes, exactly. Um, was it something that was really pushed on you? Did you take to it naturally? Or was it something that you were act actually taught and sort of encouraged to do? It was something very natural to me. You know, I was, I was always singing. Uh, it was my way of communicating, sort of. But my father preferred uh, that I had a proper... Um, uh, what do you call uh, technique, uh, singing technique? So um, it would actually probably intrigue a lot of people in the West to know that your early influences were the Police, Guns N' Roses, yeah. you know, Bon Jovi. It's not really kind of typical of what they imagine that sweet, gentle Asian woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, Indonesian, uh, we are very influenced by American music. So, so everything that goes in America, um, well, they 
right. big in Indonesia. So, and and my father pre preferred us to listen to a lot of Western music than Indonesian because back then there weren't many. Um, music available for kids my age. Um, when I was seven or nine, I, 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 I was so eager to grow up because I want people to take me seriously. And I was starting writing my own songs, but I couldn't write about love songs. I mean, what, what a nine-year-old knows about love and, you know. Uh, and um, uh, so, yeah, so uh, the, my first encounter with Western music was, was the Beatles. And then my father loved, you know, Led Zeppelin. And then, and then of course, I developed <laughs> <laughs> a love for and you got that Metallica, that Guns N' Roses. Well. Yeah, I was, I was, um, I was one of those. I don't know, maybe angry <laughs> teen <laughs> that I have that voice. So I prefer to put it to channel that energy into music rather than you know being angry to my father. And, and your, your your country folk took to you. I mean, you became something of a child star. Did that did that sort of um, that early sort of fame and early sort of interest in music and, and performing get in the way of your education in any way? Uh, but but the school was always a must. Um, I was um, even if I didn't like it because I know um, I was really good at school. I loved being at school, but I didn't like the fact that uh, we kept learning uh, what I thought. We kept learning something that that is going to be huge, really useless for us, because I know at the end of the day I was going to be a singer. But my father kept telling me that you know it is important to shape your 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 way of thinking. And you were only twelve when you met uh, producer Ian Antono. I think you produced your first album, Dunya Akupunya. Yeah. Now he um, things really moved after that because he was uh, involved with I think like six best-selling uh, best-selling albums for you. Yeah. Uh, how much did things change once he came on the scene? Once you started doing these big hits? Um, it's just that people are more more and more aware, and and uh, and then my dream really came true of being you know a, a professional singer, and 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 that I wasn't just doing this out of hobby. And, and uh, the fact that I was writing my own material, uh, people took that seriously. And, and that's what I wanted, really. And, and it's just that, you know, offer came pouring and, and um, it's just everything took off from there. And I owed him a lot to Mr. Ian. How did you adjust to that? Suddenly you, you had massive crowds coming to see your concerts, your albums were top of the charts, you were you know, really very big as far as your country people were concerned. Yeah. How were you able to adjust emotionally to that? You were young. Yeah, but I think when when you were brought into this um, um, d milieu or domain as at, at a, such a young age, and naturally, it's okay. I mean, I don't I don't find any. For me, being on stage is something very natural. I like it. It's it's uh, it's like my home. I I have my marks, and uh, I know how to play around with people, and and I know that when when a lot of people come to see me to see a concert. They, they have employed such a long effort to do that, you know? There's a, um, tickets to buy and kids, you know, babysitters probably to, to hire and things like that. So it's a, it's a proof of love. So when they come to see you, you have to give your best because, yeah, they're waiting for that moment. Of course, you did a lot while you were young, and, and you were only like about 18 when you, you married a Frenchman, and there was a big age gap. Your, oh parents, your parents got very upset with that. Michel Giorgio, I think it was. Oh, it? Yeah. oh sorry. Did, did they ever come around to accepting it? Did uh, that cause a big stir? Uh, it, the thing is, not many people know about this, because I don't um, speak about, about, about my personal life uh, yeah. back then. And, and it, it was, again, you know, one of those decisions in life where I'm, uh, I just had to, when I moved from Indonesia, it was something that I had to do. It wasn't, it wasn't, um, uh, I knew that I was not going to stay in my country forever. It is, uh, so, you know. One thing you did do though, and you were just 19 a year later, was to set up your own record company. And you were the youngest, pretty much the youngest Indonesian singer to ever do anything like that, didn't you? Yeah, because uh, uh, in Indonesia, you're not supposed, um, you cannot actually own an, a company uh, unless you're 21, because you're not major. So I had um, I had a few associates, um, and um, because I wanted to have this some kind of liberty in my artistic life, and and um, it is normal. What was it that you were sort of unhappy with or dissatisfied with in Indonesia, with all that success, um, that made you say, "Look, let's sell up and go"? It was 
Uh, actually, what we call there is the, the kind of rich problem, which is um, I had success. Uh, everything that I've done worked. So um, I didn't want to get spoiled. Um, and success is always very confusing for me because uh, at one point you stop asking yourself questions. And I didn't want to be lazy like that. Uh, so that's why I needed a challenge, a big challenge. So um, what's left was to conquer the world outside, or, or at least to try to do something. So you chose London, and of course had a culture shock there. Yeah. <laughs> and it was expensive. So you Very. were catching buses, huh? You were like, to save money. Yeah. What, tell me about this, this having to be a fake Javanese woman, though. Uh, well, because a real Javanese woman will accept everything. Um, uh, where, where in a Western world, you actually trained yourself to take no for an answer. And that is the kind of thing that I, uh, that I learned to do. And, and it's, still it's still difficult because we didn't, you know, back in Indonesia, you never had to say no to anything. You, uh, and, and Indonesian people, they still don't know how to do that. We just um, um, find our ways through it. You say maybe or <laughs> something like that, and you make up answers. But yeah, so it's something that um, that we're not used to. That the fact that I left the country and try something and then really persistent. Um, but I think when you want something, you have to you have to just do the best you can. You eventually ended up in Paris, where you said when your feet touched the ground, you felt very much at home, and it was much more natural for you. But, but did you miss the, you know, the, you, were, you were such a big star in Indonesia, you were so connected with the country. There must have been some kind of missing your home. Missing my home, yes. Missing the people I love, the, my family and friends, but not really Indonesia, not really the city, not the, really the country. Um, but it was, again, refreshing being in some place, being in a new country where nobody knew me. Uh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that kind of feeling of an anonymity. Uh, just walking around and people, are, when, when somebody is actually interested in me, it's because of me. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, it's, it's, at first it was, it was a bit weird, but then, yeah. Well, then your international career took off. I'm going to ask you about that in just a moment. Don't go away. We're going to do more one-on-one -on -one with Angun when we return. Welcome back. You're watching 101. We're speaking with Indonesian-born singer and songwriter Angun. Once you were in France, you met Eric Benzi, who was the one who persuaded you to give up on the rock a little bit, go a little more romantic <laughs> and sensual. Did you sense the change in your style? Did you feel that you could adjust easily? Yeah, I am all for big changes in life, and especially in musical life, because for me, everything, even though it's separate, it's intertwined. It's uh, it's very together. So um, and when I was uh, when I came to Paris, I was about 23. Uh, I still have my hair long until today, but uh, but I wasn't that rock chick anymore. <laughs> so yeah, so I was listening to more Shade, more Sting, more. But because of my rock background was so strong, that's what I go instantly. Um, whenever um, you know, whenever I do something. So when Eric Benzi, um, you know, offered me something that is more earthy, more feminine, I have to say, I said, yeah, it, that is, this is something that I probably should do and can do. And you became the best-selling uh, Southeast Asian artist outside, you know, the region, uh, and, and the biggest sort of star, the first who really broke through on the international scene from the mid '90s there. Um, how did uh, how did the, the audience, the, your listening audience, your your fans perceive that change? Were, were they receptive to it? They wasn't very receptive at, at first. They were just very surprised. And but then after, uh, they pride took over. They were just so proud, you know, watching somebody that they knew ever since they were small. I'm like their big sister now, and uh, I'm 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 like one of their family's members. I was reading that people in Indonesia started learning French because of your success in France. <laughs> Apparently, yes. <laughs> so this is something that is, uh, well, even though my albums, uh, my French albums, um, they're not released in, 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 in Indonesia, but it, it creates uh, sort of, you know, um, dreams for them as well. Because if she can do it, then of course I can too. And you won so many awards as well. I guess that puts pressure on you to be a role model. Is it something you think about? No, not really. No, uh, it's um, you know. Whenever I do something, I know that there is Indonesia behind, and but I do uh, everything 
for myself, you know, foremost. It's interesting also your music in, in, in the last few years has become also uh, prominent in movies. I know Luc Besson used it, uh, one of your songs, Savior, right. in, uh, in uh, tr uh, what's it, the Transporter, Transporter 2, his uh, big blockbuster hit. And then you did the, uh, the sound, you know, the singing on uh, Planet Earth, the BBC's. Uh, yes, I wrote a song for that movie and I also um, I doubled the voice. The, 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 um, I do the voice uh, over the narrator for the film in French. Has that changed your direction, your style as well because of the sudden new influences and the demands that the movies have? I actually love um, to uh, the diversity in, in what a person can do and um, as, long as, as long as it's honest. And, and, and I've always wanted to uh, you know, never belong to one, kind, one type of music, maybe because of that rock scene that keeps haunting me back. So now I want to you know, just be more broader. And uh, uh, and I think uh, you know there's not there's just names in music, but there are actually really two kinds: the good one and the bad one. I know your daughter, yeah. uh, your young daughter, Kirana. It means uh, uh, sunbeam, doesn't it? It's like a ray of light. Ray of light, yeah, in, in Indonesian. What influence have you tried to have on her, um, as in terms of her, you know, getting into music at a very early age? Is it something you want for her? I know that I want her to live, you know, surrounded by art in general, but uh, I don't want to put any pressure or whatever to her. She loves to, to, um, to draw like any kids, and she loves sing. Whenever, um, and she loves to play the piano. And, um, uh, but, you know, this is something that is very obvious. She's going to be very artistic, I think. But mostly, I want her to, um, well, she speaks Indonesian. This is one of my, my pride. I'm actually very proud of that. And then she speaks fluent French. And, uh, but it's just amazing now, how, now that I'm a mother, that, that all of uh, whatever it is that I've learned so far as theories, now it's real. You know, you can actually give that to, a chill, to, a, to somebody. So what if she becomes a rebel? Like you were. <laughs> well, then so be it. It's okay. <laughs> and I think she's she's one of those person who has you know, old soul, as we say, and and I love watching her grow. You're active also uh, in humanitarian causes. You're a goodwill ambassador for the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Yes. What what is it the kind? What is it that you see as a priority? What is it you want to achieve through that? To eradicate really uh, extreme poverty and, and, and chronic hunger, um, one child dying every six seconds. So this is, this is something that breaks my heart, and especially when in the 21st century, this, uh, the, the, this tragedy is still on. And, and we live in opulence, we live in, uh, there are a lot to eat, but there's still people who, who, who go to bed with, with their empty stomachs. And this is something that um, that I cannot be comfortable with, and that's why I, you know, I am um, I'm one of the Goodwill Ambassadors because I want the message to be heard all over the world. You also uh, are a proponent of microcredit, seeing that as a yes. way to lift. A, have you been able to see it work firsthand? Yes, actually, I went. Uh, you know, back in 2005, uh, which was the, the 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 year of microcredit. The, the winner of the micro entrepreneur was an Indonesian lady. And I went to see her uh, to Java, in Java Island, where she actually started out her business with only, with mere $40. $40. And, and, and out of that, she created a company where, where um, uh, she created a business where she actually employed um, handicapped person who don't have any, you know, uh, ability or, or, or access to any jobs. So they make, you know, cute little bags and they actually, um, they're producing a lot now and they're actually exporting it to Singapore and some, some, some countries in, in Southeast Asia and, I, and I'm very, very proud of her. Are there any other areas in which you would like to focus? Of course, you know, the poverty is a big thing and microcredit runs into that, but are there areas that, uh, that you consider ones that you would want to get involved with? Uh, anything that touches children and, 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 and drinking water. It's just, you know, again, we take everything for granted. Um, 
but but those but there are a lot of people who don't even have that who don't even have access to clean water and 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 there are children in this world who um, you know who were born and you don't know why and this is something that always angers me you know when when you go to to to, to places when you when, when you see documentaries about Darfur and and all this misery that you see and how many children are born every month in those places, and they don't even have hope. And of course, I mean, this is, you know, this is something that very delicate. Uh, it's a very delicate issue uh, because a lot of people in their in their culture um, seeing, you know, having children as as to um, as their own hope to for a better future, for a better life. But you cannot put that kind of burden into a, a child's shoulders, it's just too much. How do you remain optimistic? When you see these kind of things, of course it does touch you. How do you remain optimistic? Because you have to, because when, when there is life, there is hope, but uh, with no actions, just uh, hope is just words, you know? So, um, so you really need to do something and, and everyone can do something. You know, maybe, maybe it's just a petition, maybe it's just a signature. Um, maybe it's just spreading the message. It's a contribution, and I don't believe uh, of small contributions because every bit helps, and this is something that is very precious. Today, we have to unite ourselves with, uh, with ONGs, with, uh, with, with the UN, with everything. You have to think of others, you know. Now, of course, you've crammed a lot into your life from that, that first performance at the age of seven. And you're still, of course, a very young woman. What do you have, though, as a priority, uh, on, your, what, as a priority on your to-do list? On my to-do list? Save the world. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> no, really, to be... Uh, um, I really want to be more and more involved in this. I think uh, uh, maybe because in Indonesia I was... You know, being born and, and, and raised in this country, I was perpetually, constantly reminded that I don't live alone. I share this planet with other people. And, 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 and there are people who have less, and there are more who don't have anything. So, and, and they don't even have a voice. They, they are not even heard. So if I can use my voice and, and a little power that I have, to to be there to, to you know to to convey the message then I'm, so yeah this is something that I would love to to continue doing and it is a beautiful voice for which you will be remembered but if you and there's a long way to go still but if you were to be remembered a certain way what would you like your legacy to be ask me that again in 40 years <laughs> <laughs> promise me you'll come back with the interview of course As I I'll will. be hobbling around. <laughs> I'm doing a real pleasure. Thank you. You too. Thank you.